Good morning, Cornerstone. If you're ready to get started this morning, let's turn over to 327. Uh, we're going to go along with the topic of the sermon this morning. It's going to be about the story of God. So 327 is I love to tell the story. We'll sing all three verses. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. Love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Love to tell the story It's a wonderful opportunity and very pleasant. It's just comforting to know that you have a church home to go to and the Lord's words being preached and taught and that you're in tune with God. You're walking with God. It's just a wonderful feeling. And, and if you don't have that wonderful feeling, then maybe you just need to do some more Bible study and some more spiritual checkup. And get your heart in tune right with God. It's just, it's a blessing to be that way. When the storms of life rage, you can just go right on through them because God is with you. And they do come up. Everyone has their storms in life. Everyone has their, their ups and they, they definitely have their downs. In fact, the psalmist David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. All points of life. Does anyone have any prayer requests this morning? Uh, my friend Vic. Pray for him. John's friend Vic. Anyone else? Friend Rob. He wants to he has cancer. Friend Rob has cancer. Let's continue. Remember Jack back there as well. Jack is having some issues. Mary? And uh, I wanted to mention uh, our country. And after John gave his uh, report today, um, we just can't uh, pray for missionaries. Right. Definitely pray for missionaries. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. John got firsthand seen them. Life on the line. Yep. Uh, anyone else have any prayer requests? I, I know. remember Paul on Thursday. Was it for his yep. last? 
Paul has a, a test on Thursday, and we need to pray for that situation and for Paul. Keep his spirits up. And we need to remember our pastor and his wife as they're traveling their way today, and we're looking forward to them coming back. We do need them. <laughs> I need them. And also, um, six days till camp. Six days till camp. If you're not ready, you better start getting ready. Six <laughs> days to camp. Yep. Uh, I, th I think everybody got a text from Brother Hal that the uh, paperwork needs to be turned in by the 30th, the, the payment by the 30th. And if anybody has any, if it's going and you have any of that, you can give that to me and I will pass that along to him on Wednesday. Uh, any other prayer requests? Anything needs to be mentioned? Did I get all the announcements? I think I did. Anybody know of any announcements I missed? All right, let's go to the Lord. Oh. Send the Lord for everything that you have done, the blessings that you have uh, fulfilled in our lives all the time. Amen. Thank the Lord. You know, without the Lord, we wouldn't be where we are. You know, and without the Lord, if you look back, you think, whoa, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid to know where I would be without the Lord. If there was a building collapsed in Florida and a lot of people missing, I think, still. And, yeah. Any other prayer requests? We pray for my friend Mel. She's getting surgery the 1st of July. Okay, we'll pray for this, for Mel, that situation. Any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get back into singing, lifting up our voices in song to the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for this another wonderful opportunity. We're able to meet in your house to worship, to serve you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that you continue to help us to discern your will and your ways uh, in a manner in which we're not serving ourselves, we're not trusting our ways, but we're acknowledging you in all of your ways, and we're doing what is right in your eyes, not in our own eyes. We understand you, not ourselves. Lord, we pray for each and every one of the missionaries that are in the field, that are laboring, that are, are working, that are striving to uh, win souls to you. I pray, Lord, that you continue to lift them up and guide them and give them the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I pray that you be with each one of the, the ones that are on our hearts today in this in this auditorium, this church service, that uh, you we are, as we are praying for them, as these individuals are praying for them, that you uh, open up their minds and their hearts, that they might come to know you if they are lost, and that if they are saved, that you continue to give them that peace that passes all understanding. We ask you to be with our pastor and his wife as they are traveling. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn over to hymn number 342. 342. O oh, land of rest for thee I sigh when will that moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home will comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home to Jesus Christ I fled for rest he bade me cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till Duck me home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side no more. My steps shall roam With him I'll brave death's chilling tide And reach my heavenly home We'll work till
Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Right over the other side of the page, number 343, Footsteps of Jesus. We'll sing the first second and we will stand on the last verse, and we have one special this morning before we have our preaching hour. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. Though the footprints falling lead us to Solomon's fountain helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Let's all stand. Then at last when on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus in that is thrown. Footsteps of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. Brother David, would you take up our offering for us? And then lead us in prayer, please. Father God, Lord, we thank you uh, once again for this uh, wonderful day you've given to us. Uh, it's uh, another great opportunity, Lord, that we can uh, come to you and uh, uh, give you glory and honor for this uh, day, Lord. Worship the Lord, and we thank you for all the blessings that you provided to us day by day uh, for uh, guiding us and providing our uh, job and work, Lord, and continue to uh, provide, Lord, uh, for our family. And even this time, Lord, that we can uh, continue to return to you all these uh, blessings that you have provided to us. And so, I pray, Lord, that you will use this place, Lord, for uh, your glory. And
empty crowds round you gathered in the midst of the storm is your sheep tossed and battered are you weary and worn don't lose hope someone's praying for you this very day and peace be still is already on the way someone is praying for you someone is praying for you so when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two remember someone is praying for you when it seems that you've prayed till your strength is all gone and your tears fall like raindrops all the day long he cares and he knows just how much you can bear he'll speak your name to someone in prayer someone is praying for you someone is praying for you so when it seems you're all alone and your heart will break in two remember someone is praying for you remember someone is praying for you morning cornerstone missionary baptist church again i i thank you for your coming out to listen i pray that you uh, listen intently and uh we are going to cover a whole lot of verses today the reason that is i've titled this sermon this morning god's story beginning at genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and we are going to go through God's story. There's a lot of times scripture is being taught wonderful, preached wonderful, and it's just beautiful messages on particular things. But I want to focus on the scope of God's story this morning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm going to read this verse and then we'll go to Lord in prayer. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity where we're able to freely, freely stand and proclaim your word. Lord, I pray that you convict the hearts of each and every one of us and those that are lost in this world, Lord, that that conviction never stops if they're lost, that they might come to know your story and it is a wonderful story of love that you gave your life that we might have eternal life and that we not only read it and study it, but we observe it, we teach it, we preach it. We, we become the servants that you want us to be where you're glorified. We ask, Lord, that you be with, again, the prayer requests mentioned that are on our hearts, both the physical and the spiritual. We pray for our pastor as he travels and his wife as they travel. Do you give them safe travels and bring them back safely to us? We pray for all those who are traveling. We pray for, 
for all those in, in the missionary works that you, you continue to teach them and to show them and to guide them and to continue to proclaim your story, which is the wonderful story of love. I ask, Lord, that you help me to speak plainly. Help me to uh, get across your story, your understanding, your way, your truths, that this congregation and all those under the sound of my voice might get a better understanding and have a closer walk with you. And it's all in Jesus' precious name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Go down to verse number 26 in verse number 27. After God created, if you read the story of God's creation, it is a wonderful thing and it was a good thing and there was no sin. And then God's creation in verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And then you go over to chapter 2 and verse 7 and you see how God took man and formed him. It says in verse number seven, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He picked up some dirt off the ground. He picked up his earth, his creation, and he breathed into the nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God's creation, God made man. God made man a living soul. Go down to verse number 18. And in verse number 18, after God made man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. And I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called the living creature, that was the name thereof. Boy, was he a smart man. <laughs> a lot of animals. And Adam gave names to the cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. For, uh, but for Adam, there was not a help meet found for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore man, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and the man and his wife and they were not ashamed. We have the beautiful creation of God. We have the beautiful creation of man and of woman. And then in Genesis chapter 3, Beginning in verse 1, we have a terrible incident that came about. There was a serpent. This serpent's name was the devil. He was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, the first lie spoken. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Wow! Don't lies sound good. But it's not God's way or God's truths. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes to make and the tree to be desired and to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam, his wife, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest me, she is the one that caused me to eat. Here comes the blame game. Doesn't that just like us to point the finger? God said unto the woman, What is it thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. Well, it's just no, her fault. No, it's his fault. But it's never my blame. That's what sin does. Sin tells us it's not my fault. It's somebody else's. The Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. At creation, I believe snakes had legs. Today when I see a snake, he still ain't got no legs. Still crawls on his belly in the dust of the ground. Because why? Because our great creator said, that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. And it has never, ever stopped. Turn with me to Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5. We see the wickedness of man, the, point, the finger pointing. We see that the fruitful and multiply, they multiplied what? More sinners, more finger pointers, more people that pointed at somebody else's wrongs and then fights and, and then big confusion happens. And in, Roman, in, in Genesis 6 and verse 5, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth because of sin that entered in. And that every imagination of the thought of a man's heart was only evil continually. Go down to verse number 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt. For all flesh hath corrupted his way upon the earth. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come up before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Noah, you go build you an ark and get in it. I'm going to save you because you found grace in my eyes. You were, you were just. You understood your unrighteousness. You didn't point at anybody else, but you found grace in me. I'm going to save you, but I'm going to remove this wickedness from my creation. Turn with me to Genesis chapter number 8, beginning at verse number 15. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 15. God spake to Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee. Of all flesh, with uh, both the fowl, the cattle, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply in the earth. And then you find in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, that God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Before the flood, wickedness was great. God didn't mean for wickedness to overtake his creation. God destroyed it. God started over again with Noah. Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, and verse number 17. He made a covenant with Noah. And he said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Anybody here ever seen a rainbow? Tell me there's no God. Amen. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be, shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. 
And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have made, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Then we find over the process of time that through lineages in the replenishing of God's earth that we find a man named Terah in Genesis chapter 11 in verse number 26. And it says, Terah lived 70 years and he begat Abraham. We see Abraham come into the picture and there is this, this, this man that God has designed that God will use to bring forth God's ways, God's truths, God's righteousnesses. He wasn't going to use Abraham to, to, to make people do things to make them righteous. He was going to use Abraham to show people God's righteousness and how they were unrighteous. And in Genesis chapter number 12, in verse number 2, and he told Abraham, I will make thee of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And then you go down to Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 2. God told Abraham, I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And we find that in the lineage of Abraham, we find that there is a children that is born unto God called the Israelites. And today we call them the Jewish nation. And as they were, as they were growing, they went into Egypt and they lived and prospered in Egypt. And then there was a, an Egyptian king that came into Egypt. And he brought the children of Israel into bondage. And the children, as the children of Israel grew, the Egyptian king said, You know what? These people are getting too many. Let's, 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 let's make them slaves. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse number 23, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came upon the, up to the Lord God by reason of their bondage and God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. God remembered his covenant. And then we find that after he remembered his covenant, that God made Moses. And God made Moses. And Moses, you know the story how he was put in a, in a basket and he was pushed off into the river and he was raised under, under Pharaoh's, uh, uh, an Egyptian woman. And he was raised up and, and he was weaned by Moses' mother. Not the, they didn't know that that was Moses' mother. And, and you guys know the story. I don't want to go into that story because this is God's story. God made Moses. God told Moses to go into the children, go into Egypt. And I want you to take my people out because I'm making you a people. I'm making you a great nation. And in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 12, the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee the tables of stone. As the children of Israel were gone out into the wilderness, they were at Mount Horeb, and God told Mo Moses, come up into the mountain in Exodus 24, 12, and God come and, and, and I will and I will and I, I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And then we have the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the Leviticus, the Levitical tribe. Of Israel numbers we have Deuteronomy we have Joshua we have judges we have the judges in the Old Testament the Israelites we have Ruth we have the story of Ruth where Jesus was is, is going to be coming out of all these lineages down through she's through Ruth but that's why we have Ruth we have first and second Samuel we have the the Kings we have the Chronicles we have Ezra we have the stories of Nehemiah we have the stories of Esther Job we have the Psalms we have Proverbs, the wise sayings of Solomon. We have Ecclesiastes. We have Song of Solomon. 
We have Isaiah. We have Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel. We have Hosea. We have Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Children of God, God's chosen people, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. We have, after God has created his people, we have all these stories in the Old Testament. Everything that talks about Jesus, how God used his people. And when we come up to Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4 in verse 4, turn with me there. Malachi chapter 4 in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And then we have the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Luke chapter 1 and verse 30 tells us, that an angel came to Mary and said, Mary, fear not, for thou hast found favor with God, our Creator, the sustainer of life, the one who took dirt from the ground and picked it up and breathed into the nostrils of man, the breath of life. Mary, thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. You know who Jesus is? Remember back in Genesis that we read earlier? I will put enmity between thee and the woman he told Satan. That's Jesus. That's what Jesus was going to do. Jesus is going to pay for our sin. Satan caused man to fall away from God. Jesus brought man back by his death. Verse 32. Luke chapter 1 and verse 32. He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there shall be no end. You know where King God's kingdom is? In heaven? You know where his business is carried out? In the church? In fact, in Luke chapter 22, the angels, they went out and, in, and they went out to this country and in, in Luke 2 and 8, and there were shepherds abiding in the field and they were keeping watch over their flock by night as the scriptures, God's word says. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them, fear not. You know, when Jesus comes, we don't need to fear. Don't fear. We, we have victory in Jesus. Amen. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. God put enmity between Satan and the woman. From her seed and his seed, the seed of unrighteousness to the seed of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Do you know all people can be saved? Those people that say, I don't believe there's a Jesus can be saved if they simply believe there is a Jesus. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ came, if you read in the scriptures, of all the miracles that he did and all the works that he did, and he had followers, he, he, he made his disciples, the twelve, the first church, he sat down after he was tempted of the devil and, the de the de and he told the devil that you, you can't live by bread alone, but you got to live by every word of God. He told the people, I am not come to destroy the law. Even though the law was a curse, man couldn't attain it. Man couldn't abide by it. I didn't come to destroy it. I didn't come to destroy the prophets. He said, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to fulfill what? What God said to Satan, 
I will put enmity between you and the woman. I made a perfect creation. And you came in and through your deceits and your lies, it got corrupted. I had nothing to do with it, but I love my creation. I love my people. I love what I did. I will pay the way back. You did the sin. I'll pay the way back. John chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word. Do you know in the beginning was Jesus? The Word was with God. Jesus was with God. And the Word was God. Jesus is God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, the same to care, came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. John was not that light. It says here he wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. When you came into the world, you came in in darkness. When you came into the world, you came into a, a life of sin. You were born a sinner. Jesus came in and was light of the world to light every sinner. He was not in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. It's God's will and commandment that man put their faith and trust in Him. Jesus told a man, except ye be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. John 3 and 14 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus must be lifted up that he might pay the sin debt, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that in the beginning he told Satan, I'm going to put enmity. I am going to pay away, give away that my might buy back the creation of man that you have allowed to, to corrupt with the sin nature by your lies. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's how he did it. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Satan entered in, we were condemned to hell. He lied. If you don't believe in Jesus, you were following the lies of Satan today. God didn't send his son to the world to condemn the world. Why? You're already condemned. But that the world through him might be saved from Satan's lies, from Satan's wicked ways. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You had no work to do in your salvation. There's no work you can do to get it. There's no work you can do to lose it. There's no work, period. God said, I will put enmity, not you. I will put enmity. I will pay the way. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come in the world. Jesus is in the world. But men love darkness rather than light. That's why every pew is not filled up, every seat. Men love darkness rather than light. That's why people say there is no God, because they love darkness rather than light. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23. Before faith came, we were kept under a law. But what was I, what I say the law was earlier? What Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23 says. We were shut up in, under the faith, should after, afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. God made the law through Moses to teach the people that they were unrighteous and God was righteous. That was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ who is righteous. That we might be justified by faith. Not by feeding everybody in the world. Not by giving all the money in the world to the poor. But by faith in Jesus Christ in him alone. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Thank God we are not under the law. Thank God we're, we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 26, For ye are all children of God. How? By faith in Jesus Christ. That's God's story. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 through 14. Hebrews chapter 10. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 4 through 14. God has to put these things in the scripture because we think that we have to do something be something to attain, uh, attain eternal life. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. When, when was the blood of bulls and goats ever used to take away sins? Never. But they were used to show a picture of the taking away of sins. Jesus Christ's blood took away our sins. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a bloody, but but a body thou hast prepared me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I am come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do the will of God. And it was the will of God above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure in them, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I am come to do the will, thy will, O God, to take away the first, the law, that he may establish the second, by the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1 and verse number 17. Romans chapter 1, verse number 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. I'm going to start at verse 16 for clarification. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is it? It's the salvation. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Christ is the power of God to salvation. Nothing else. Nothing more. Nothing less. God. To everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. In God's story, the righteousness of God is His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life that we may have eternal life if we would but simply believe in Him. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Do I have to feed 
5,000 people to have faith? No. But if I have faith, I'm going to feed 5,000 people. Do you understand? Does it make sense? Galatian chapter 3, verse number 11. No man is justified by the law on the side of God. That's God's story. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. No man is justified by the law on the side of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. In what? Jesus Christ, the living sacrifice for our sins. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, before Jesus was ever physically here, it was known what was going to happen to pay man's sin debt. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgression, our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities. We talked about in Sunday school this morning the bruising let me explain it, just in case you don't understand the bruising. First off, he was taken. And you find in Scripture, he could have called 10,000 angels. They were at the ready. Didn't do it. He was taken. He was taken and he was convicted wrongfully. And he was taken and then scourged. You know what that scourged? Well, before he was scourged. Let me tell you what happened before he was scourged. They took a crown of thorns. And I remember when I was a kid growing up, a preacher had went over to Israel. And he brought back with him thorns that they thought was the size of the thorns that was used. And he took that and he, and he, and he formed it into a, a crown of thorns. And the spikes on that thing were that long. And he kept it on a, in his family room on a shelf. And I remember that. And I remember walk, walking up to grab it to touch it. And I poked my finger and it bled. I don't, I don't think I've ever told that far of the story, but it bled. And it put something in my mind and I've never forgot it. And every time I hear a preacher preach about the crown of thorns that's placed on Jesus' head, it was taken and put on his head. And I don't believe it was nicely done. I believe they took a rod after they put it up there because they didn't want to push it down with their hand and they beat it on his head. There are pictures of, uh, that, that I don't believe show an accurate picture of the blood and how bad it was of the crown of thorns it was put on his head. He was slapped in the face. You been slapped in the face? It makes you mad. He was slapped in the face. He was spit on. You have been spit on? In the face? Real close? Spit on? Spit on. Then they took and they ripped the robe from his body and they gambled with it. And with a stripped down body, they tied him up and then they beat him with a cat of nine tails. A, a whip with shards of the sharpest things they had at the time that was capable of ripping the flesh from the body. That, in fact, the scripture says he was marred more than any man. God's story is that he loved you so much that he was willing to give his son to go through this chastisement for you. After the blood was ripped from his body with a cat of nine tails and the flesh removed, the beard pulled from his face, he was taken to a cross and I don't believe he had to go unwillingly. He willingly went and I believe he laid his hands out. And they nailed nails through his hands into wood so that he wouldn't fall off the cross once they stood him up. And when they stood him up, I guarantee you they didn't do it gently. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This bloody, 
mass of a man who could have called 10,000 angels at any time. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. You know what he did after that? He was in the grave for three days. He rose up. He went to his disciples, his, uh, his first church, and he didn't complain about what just happened to him. How many of us have to complain? Oh, look what, do you see what they did to me? You know what he did? Preach to a lost and dying world who will spend eternity in hell without me. I did this for you. I did this for them. Go you into the entire world and preach the gospel. God's story is the gospel of his creation and his saving power through his son to save man in his creation. He said unto his disciples, Mark 16 and 15. You can find it in the other Gospels too. Go ye into the world. He told him, he said, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go through all these persecutions for my name's sake. You know what? So be it. Let it happen. You're going to receive crowns of righteousness in heaven. You're going to enter into heaven and, and God's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful steward. Thou good and faithful. You have, enter in. Enter in. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what that means? Don't be biased toward who you think you needs the gospel and who don't. That person you don't think needs the gospel needs it more than you could possibly imagine. You ever have somebody come and ask you questions who you would have never thought in a thousand years would have ever wanted to know anything about Jesus? That's because you weren't, didn't have the mind of God in you, the mind of Christ. We need to witness and preach every creature. And in verse number 16, it says, Those that believe and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. God's story is for man through the Word of God. Through 1,500 years of writings, God laid his story out. From his beautiful creation to Satan entering in and to him paying the way that, that he can buy back what was lost through sins, through lies, through deceit. My question to you this morning, do you believe God's story enough to not only put your faith and trust in him, but to do what he says? He's always with us. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. I'd like to be more worthy at being able to say God's word. I don't even feel worthy saying it. I hope I brought it out good enough that you got it. I have to preach to myself every day. When I preach this message, I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. Now, are you ready to walk with the Lord? Let's all stand. We're going to have one verse of invitation. Or we may have two verses. I don't know. But whatever the Lord's calling you to do, step up. Make it known. Follow Jesus. What is our number? 564. 564. I meet the every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine.
need Thee, every hour I need Thee, O oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. We want to do one more verse. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby, temptation. Lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Brother John, will you close us in prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for this message. And Lord, may we always remember the great sacrifice that you made for us. Help us, Lord, to always follow you. Help us, Lord, to always stay close and abide with you and to abide in you. Thank you for Brother Ron. Thank you for each member of this church. Thank you for our pastor. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, go with us now as we uh, break away from this fellowship and that you might bring us back safely again this afternoon. Thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen.